Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. Looking forward to just jumping straight into God's Word. Today we're picking up where we left off in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And we're continuing uh, on this theme of, of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And we've been tracking with this theme for some time. So uh, we're going to continue on today and uh, looking forward to spending time together with you in God's Word. So let's pray and then we'll just jump right into it. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather. Thank you for your word. God, speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What's a good neighbor to you? When Christy and I uh, moved into a new home, or perhaps we had new neighbors who moved in next door or around us, we'd often bake cookies for our new neighbors to get to know them. It was sort of an icebreaker. We would do this uh, many times just to get to know them. In the last 12 years, uh, since living here in Australia, we've moved 10 times. And sadly, we found that most of our neighbors aren't really interested in getting to know us, and some aren't even interested in meeting us. It's, it's been unfortunate. Now, maybe it's due to, you know, renters constantly coming and going, moving in and out. They don't want to invest in somebody whom they think is just gonna be gone in six months or, or a year. And I can get that, I understand that. but. If I'm honest, it's easy to succumb to being disinterested in people who aren't really interested in me. I haven't made much of an effort lately in being a good neighbor to those living around me, and neither have they. I mean, that's been my experience. Now, that said, I'm polite, I'm friendly, I'm, I'm often trying to strike up a conversation with my neighbors when it's appropriate. You know, if they're off and running to work, obviously, you're not going to have a conversation because they're busy or I'm busy. You know, you get it. But truth be told, I, I really don't know my neighbors that well. I know a couple of them. I know them by name even, but I don't know them. Not at all, really. But is that who Jesus is talking about in this section? Is that what he's referring to? Is that what this passage is all about? Now, in this passage, Jesus does illustrate what a good neighbor is which is part of the bigger picture of what a true follower of Christ looks like. And I think that's Luke's objective, which he actually began back in verse 23 of chapter 9, when he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what Jesus said. And then later on in the chapter, Luke, or rather Jesus, illustrated further what it meant to be a follower of Christ and Luke is helping us to still understand the cost of following Jesus by piecing together these stories. And so we fall, we, excuse me, we saw what a follower of Christ looks like uh, earlier in this chapter. He looks like an ambassador for Christ in verses 1 to 24. And now we'll see that they also look like a good neighbor in verses 25 to 37. Next time we'll see that followers of Christ are true worshipers of God. But what does it mean to be a good neighbor? Does it mean being friendly with people living in our neighborhood? Well, partly. But more so, it means helping people in need as we are able to. Helping needy people as we're able. That's what we're gonna see here in this passage. Now, I think this passage can be broken up into three sections or three points. There is, first of all, the theological discussion that takes place in verses 25 to 29, and that is illustrated and clarified by living examples in verses 30 to 35, and then it concludes with a godly challenge in verses 36 and 37. So let's begin with the theological discussion, picking up in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Do this, and you'll live. Now, it says, Behold, that's an indicator that Luke is, is sort of moving on from the previous topic in the previous section. And he says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test. 
Now, we've moved on from the private discussion that took place in verses 23 and 24, in which Jesus spoke to his disciples privately, to now a public setting, which may have taken place in one of the towns that the disciples had previously visited. You know, the towns that they had gone to to prepare the way for Jesus. They may be in one of those towns now, and that's where this takes place. But since this man stood up to question Jesus, he was sitting down, and it's likely Jesus was teaching people who were seated and listening. And this guy had heard enough. He stood up then to challenge Jesus to a theological debate. Now, a lawyer wasn't a civil or criminal lawyer like we think of today. That's not what this guy was. Lawyers then were experts in the Old Testament scriptures, especially the Torah, the first five books of Moses. They went so far as to literally bind the scriptures on their foreheads and on their hands or arms, taking literally Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 8, which says God speaking to Moses, to the, to the people, the nation, and he says, you shall bind them. Bind what? The law of God, the words of God. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. And many Jews from that point on, especially by the time of Jesus, had taken this literally. Now, it needs to be understood literally in one sense because it means embracing wholeheartedly the word of God and adhering to what God says. But they took it to the the extreme where they actually created these phylacteries, these little boxes in which they would contain the law of God or their, you know, favorite scriptures and things like that. They would put these in the box and they would actually wear it on their head and they sometimes would put it on their arm, but they would wrap their arms and their hands with these leather bands. And that's what they did in observance of what God said in Deuteronomy 6, 8. And so this guy who stood up to question Jesus and challenged him to a debate may well have had these phylacteries on his head and his arms and and he might have been wearing these things. In fact, it's likely he was. At any rate, he stood up to challenge Jesus to put him to the test. Notice that, which is how we know he wasn't genuinely seeking an answer. He believed he knew the truth and he thought he could win an argument with Jesus. Not a wise thing to think, not a, not a wise thing to attempt. You're never gonna win an argument with God, never. So he asked, teacher, what shall I do to inherit life or eternal life? Now think about that question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? First of all, we don't do anything to inherit something. An inheritance is a gift bestowed to a benefactor. Jews literally believed that they inherited the kingdom of God because of their connection to Abraham. Because of their their bloodline, they felt entitled to the inheritance that God promised to Abraham. It was their birthright. So how would Jesus answer this? How was Jesus going to answer this? What must I do? Well, we already feel entitled to it. Secondly, Jesus publicly taught and demonstrated that salvation and eternal life is the result of faith in God. Salvation, eternal life is the result of faith in God. Jesus taught this. He showed it many times. And so we don't do anything to obtain this except believe and trust. So again, how is Jesus going to answer this question? Now, at this point, I think the lawyer's feeling pretty solid in his argument. He's feeling like he's, he's got a leg up on the Lord. We know, Jews, uh, how eternal life belongs to descendants of Abraham. We know that it's our inheritance which, which is obtained by our bloodline and our obedience to the law. And so will Jesus agree with what we know to be true in the law or... Will he indict himself as a heretic by talking about faith, which is in contrast to the law? Now, notice Jesus' reply. He didn't reply with a rebuttal, but with a question concerning the lawyer's understanding of the law. Verse 26, he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In other words, how do you understand the law? What's your interpretation of the law? 
And the man said, verse 27, he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He quoted Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and Leviticus 19, 18. Loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind means loving God before all others with the entirety of your life, being completely sold out to God and committed to Him wholeheartedly. Your life entirely is devoted to God. That's what that means. And the second command is born out of the first. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, if we're loving God with the entirety of our being, we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. I'll talk more about this in a minute. He said, essentially, this is how I understand the law, Jesus. If we love God and we love our neighbor, by obedience, we'll inherit eternal life. That's what he's saying. Notice what Jesus said, verse 28. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. That's right. You're right on. Do this and you will live. Do this and you'll live. Now, theoretically, a person could inherit eternal life if they were morally pure and perfect. Theoretically, a person could go to heaven if they were perfect, if they never broke any of God's commands. But Jesus knew this was impossible. He knew no one has ever done this. If you love God entirely without faltering, if you love your neighbor as yourself without ever failing them, then you'll go to heaven. You will not need grace or mercy from God. Now, let me put it another way. If you never sin against God, nor against your fellow man, you will earn a ticket to heaven and you'll have no need for the grace of God. The problem is, the Bible is clear, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, not even one, and the wages of sin is death. The lawyer knew this because that's why God uh, initiated the sacrificial system. He knew we Jews, we offer sacrifices to atone for our sins because none of us are perfect. We've all failed the Lord. And so he knew this is what Jesus meant, and he knew he'd already failed. He knew he was in trouble, and essentially he knew he'd already lost the argument. So rather than addressing his failure or succumbing to the righteous standards of the law, he evaded the issue and he sought a loophole. Notice what he says. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? See, he's changing the subject from how to who or what. Who is my neighbor? He's avoiding the issue. Why is he trying to justify himself? Because he knew he'd failed to keep the law. He knew it wasn't even possible. So now he's looking for a back door. There's got to be another way in. Who is my neighbor then? Because in his mind... If his neighbor is his fellow Jew, if that's the case, well, then he's doing great. Because loving people you like is easy. If that's all God requires, I'm in. Because Jews at that time, particularly those amongst the Pharisaical camp, well, to them, they understood their neighbors to mean their fellow Jews. Jesus then responded to the question, moving on from the first question of what must I do to obtain eternal life to now, who our neighbor is. And he turns to three living examples. The two are essentially the same, and one is unique. Notice what he says in verse 30. Jesus replied to him, to his question about who his neighbor is. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, 
Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, this would have been a familiar scene to Jesus' audience, and particularly to the lawyer who would ask the question. It may have even been a true story. Now, it says in the heading of your Bible that this is a parable, and it may have been a parable, but there's no reason to believe it's not an actual event. It could have been headline news, what happened here. In either case, Jericho was about 25 to 30 kilometers north of Jerusalem. And it was about a 900 meter descent from Jerusalem to Jericho down a windy road. And this particular stretch of road had actually earned the nickname the Bloody Way because it was ideal for bandits and bad guys. And a lot of people were robbed and, and killed and assaulted on this road. And yet it was a common road for Jews traveling between Jerusalem and Galilee since it allowed them to bypass Samaria. Now, why would they bypass Samaria? Because Jews, and especially Orthodox Jews, they considered Samaria the place of the unclean half-breeds. You know, the, the place where Jew and Gentile had co-married uh, and, 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 you know, created this half-breed race. They hated each other. The Jews thought they were unclean and not true descendants of Abraham. The Samaritans hated the Jews because they hated them. And there was this animosity amongst these people. So Jews, they avoided Samaria. They went around it. So this man, presumably a Jew who was traveling alone, he, in fact, never a good idea to travel alone, particularly on this stretch of road. He was attacked. He was stripped down. He was left naked, he was beaten, and left for dead. It says he was half dead. So along the road, this well-traveled road, lay this bloodied man, naked and dying. A priest walking along the road saw the man, and he decided to steer clear, even going to the opposite side of the road so as not to come near to the man. Now, we don't know where he was going, or why he was traveling. We don't know anything about this priest, but this man of God, this man who was called to, to mediate between God and humanity, a man who is expert in the scriptures and who would have known that God commanded him as well as their people to love their neighbor, even to love strangers. He avoided this helpless, needy man. He avoided him when he knew what the law said, and he knew that the law told him to help this man. Now, we can only assume why he avoided him. He either felt he didn't have time or ability to help, or maybe he assumed the man was dead because, you know, I mean, he's bleeding, he's bloody, he's naked, he's laying there. He, he may have been conscious, he may not have been conscious. But if he was dead and the priest touched him, he'd be ceremonially unclean and therefore unable to perform his priestly duties for a time until he went through a process of cleansing and he would have been unable to uh, be in the home with his family and others and he would have to go through this lengthy process of cleansing before he could be reintroduced to his duties and to his family and so forth. So if he thought he was dead that would have been his reason for not wanting to go near to him. But the priest could have helped him. He could have helped him because the implication is he was first on the scene and he decided not to help him. Oh, I don't want to get near that. I don't want to get involved with that. I don't want to be a part of that. And he moved on. His schedule, his plans were more important than saving the life of someone in need, someone who was dying. James 4.17 says, To him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. And so even though it's not spelled out here, it's clearly implied that this priest was in sin by avoiding this man because he would have known to do good to this guy, but he didn't. 
The Levite who came after him was an assistant to the priest. Levites were essentially assistant pastors, if you want to put it that way. The Levites weren't um, descendants of Aaron, who was of the priestly tribe, but they were descendants of Levi. So they're called Levites. They're ministers in the temple, but not the same as the priests. They were assistants to the priest. So he comes along and he follows suit. He, he did the same thing as the priest did, following, following the example of his mentor and of his godly leader. Sad. Now, Jesus' listeners would have been tracking with him. They would have been paying attention, perhaps visualizing the familiar scene. Everyone knew this road. They would have understood the crime scene and what had taken place and how the priest and the Levite avoided any involvement. They would have got it. They're tracking. They're, they're yep, yeah, we see what you're saying. We understand what's going on. And since Jesus began with the priest and then the Levite, perhaps they're thinking that he's going to talk now about a common Jew who comes upon this helpless man. But Jesus surprised them when he spoke about the Samaritan being the hero. The unclean Samaritan acted more righteously than the religious Jews, and he provided the definition of loving your neighbor. This guy, who was despised in their eyes, provided the understanding, the definition of what it meant to be a good neighbor. Notice what happened. When he saw the wounded man, that is when the Samaritan saw the wounded man, it says he had compassion on him. He had compassion. The other two had no compassion on him. His actions showed his love for God. While their unwillingness to help revealed their lack of love for God. What do I mean? Well, listen to 1 John 4, 20. It says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 21, and this commandment, John writes, this commandment we have from him, Whoever loves God must also love his brother. <clears throat> now, it's important to understand what John is talking about. He's saying that true love for God will be manifest by love for others. He's not saying, if you say you love God, well, then you have to love your brother, even if you don't want to. That's not what he's saying. He's saying love for God will be manifested by love for others. Love for others will be the evidence of your true love for God. See, love is an action word. These guys' actions were unloving, revealing their lack of compassion and exposing their shallow and superficial love for God. And that's Jesus' point to this whole story. He's showing the contrast between good and bad neighbors by revealing the Samaritan's compassion for others and their lack of compassion for others. See, notice what compassion for his fellow man compelled the Samaritan to do. It says he poured wine on his wounds, the alcohol serving as a disinfectant, and oil which helped soothe the pain. And then he bandaged him up. Now the victim was apparently unable to walk and so the Samaritan hoisted him onto his own animal to carry him while he himself walked next to them. Then he brought him to the inn. That's sort of like an ancient bed and breakfast. He got a room and he took care of the man. Now he couldn't stay. He did have commitments. So he gave the innkeeper two denarii. Two denarii, that's two days wage. That would have lodged this man for several days weeks. I read one commentary that said that uh, the typical price to stay in an inn was about a twelfth of a denarii. If that's true, then two denarii would be about 24 days. So he's got several weeks of lodging to cover him. 
while he recuperates. And then he told the innkeeper to look after the man and he promised to repay any debts he incurs when he returns from his trip. Now, was this a disruption in his plans? Yes, definitely. He's traveling somewhere, he's got somewhere to go, he's got people to be with. This would have disrupted his plans. Did he get dirty helping this man? No doubt he did. I mean, the guy was naked and bloody and he helped him get to his animal and presumably he helped him get dressed and all the rest. So it would have been messy. It would have been awkward. It would have been uncomfortable. Was it a financial sacrifice? Yeah, definitely. Two days wage. I mean, he earned that money for, from the work that he did, but he gladly helped this man who was in need. Did he go out of his way to help this man in need? Yeah, he went out of his way. That's what compassion does. And that compassion is born from genuine love for God. Because love for God and intimacy with Christ allows for God's love to flow from us. If we're truly devoted to the Lord, the love of God flows through the ministry, through the life, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, love is the fruit of the Spirit. And so when we truly love God, that love flows. The religious folk, they couldn't be bothered because they hadn't obeyed the first and the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with your whole heart and all your being. They, they weren't doing that. To them, the priority was obedience to the law more than intimacy and fellowship with God. Interesting, because they thought their religious duty actually brought them close to God, but it didn't. It kept them actually far away. That's why David in Psalm 51, that's why he said to the Lord, for you do not delight in sacrifice or else I would give it, nor are you pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God aren't religious duties, but they're a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. And these, O oh God, you will not despise. God desires fellowship with him because fellowship will produce and lead to obedience. It's not the other way around. Obedience doesn't lead to devotion and fellowship and intimacy with God, but intimacy, fellowship and devotion to God will produce and lead to obedience and it will to lead to showing love toward others. See, it comes back to a condition of the heart, doesn't it? Luke 12, 34 says, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, what, what's your treasure? Where do you put all your time and energy? What is important to you? What do you value most? Because that's where your heart will be. If your treasure is in Christ, your heart will be with Christ. Jesus also said in Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. But an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. The things you say and the things you do reveal where your heart is truly at. And it shows what you value and where your treasure is. That's why Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. Keep it from covetousness. Keep it from idolatry. Keep it from greed and lust and all the things that would tear us away from God and cause us to hurt people. That's why David was known to be a man after God's own heart because he knew his heart was wicked and deceitful. He knew what in his heart he was capable of doing. And so he sought God's heart. He wanted God's heart. He, 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 he wanted the things that broke the heart of God to break his own heart because that would keep him close to the Lord. That would keep him intimate with God. That would allow him 
to remain near to the Lord and, 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 and hear the heartbeat of God and feel the pulse of God to do the things that God would want him to do. See, coming back to the story, the lawyer here, he got it right. When Jesus asked what the law said about inheriting eternal life, he said, you shall love the Lord your God and you shall love your neighbor. Jesus said in another place, these are the two greatest commandments. But the Lord replied to him and he said, right on, you got it, that's it. Now do it. The problem was he wasn't able to do it. He couldn't do it, not in his own strength, not in and of himself. And at that point, the lawyer should have said to him, Jesus, I'm unable to do this. I've already failed, in fact. Help me to love God and help me to love my neighbor. But instead, he sought to justify himself, seeking another way than humble surrender. He sought to justify himself. Many people seek to justify themselves rather than surrendering to God. Well, I'm a good person. I always do the right thing. I give to charities. I'm okay. Don't seek to justify yourself. Surrender to God. Surrender to Christ. Well, when he sought to justify himself, Jesus then showed him what loving your neighbor looks like. It looks like showing compassion and mercy to a person in need as he spoke about the Samaritan helping a Jew, interestingly, to bridge the gap of racial hatred. In other words, there's this underlying theme here. The Samaritan was helping his enemy and he gladly did it. In fact, he went out of his way to help him and he helped him extravagantly. He sacrificed for his enemy. The Samaritan went out of his way for his enemy. He risked his own life to help a Jew who was among those who despised him. Now, what could this lawyer say to justify himself? How could he argue his point any further? He couldn't. He was forced to concede. And now we turn to this last point here, and that is the godly challenge. But notice, first of all, the lawyer's reply. Actually, Jesus asks him, verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. He couldn't deny it. He conceded. The one who showed him mercy. That's who proved to be a good neighbor. It was clear who proved to be a good neighbor. But Jesus asked him anyway, causing him to admit to what he wouldn't want to admit to. This man proved to be a neighbor to the one in need. Notice though, the lawyer couldn't even say the word the Samaritan. He didn't say to Jesus, the Samaritan was a good neighbor. He couldn't because of his own hatred towards his fellow man. And so he said, the one who showed this victim mercy, that's who proved to be a good neighbor. He couldn't deny it, couldn't deny it. Even though he couldn't say the word, he still couldn't deny it. Now the word mercy is a manifestation of pity. It speaks of one who uses their resources to take care of the needs of a needy person. The Samaritan showed him mercy and the lawyer couldn't deny it. And so Jesus concluded with a challenge to the one who initially challenged him. And he said to him, you go and you do likewise. You follow the example of the Samaritan. You go and you do likewise. You go and show mercy to those in need, even to your enemies. Now keep in mind, Jesus is talking to a guy who was a theological expert, who believed that he was doctrinally sound, who thought he was right with God, but he was dead wrong. And Jesus clearly shows that theology must lead to practicality. Theology is useless if it's just information you take in. 
because it's always meant to produce transformation and lead to action. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. If you say you love God, then you will love people and your love for God will be manifested by helping people in need. Now, what does that look like? Because we think of our context and we wonder, well, what does that look like? Does it look like sending money to overseas missions or giving money to local charities? Well, not if we do these things to feel good about ourselves, and many people do. But if we're led by the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit is leading us to get involved with these in a financial way, then sure, that's, that's part of it. I think it's more than that. It involves rolling up your sleeves and getting involved in the work of helping people. All of us, I, I'm convinced, all of us are called to do this. Not just the hired minister, not just the pastoral team, not just the elders or deacons. All of us are called to roll up our sleeves and get involved in helping people and people in need. Well, what does that look like though? Because that's gonna vary. It will vary from person to person to whom we help and how we help them. It might be helping the homeless. It could be helping orphans and widows. It might be helping a new believer grow in their faith. It's gonna vary from person to person. When I was 21 years of age and I met Jesus and I began to walk with the Lord as an infant in Christ, man, I was lost, I was wounded deeply, and I was alone. I didn't know anybody who was traveling the path. I didn't know anyone. And God put me in touch, and I won't go into the whole story now, but God put me in touch with this young couple. They were about my age. They had been married less than a year. And I knew the girl from high school, Dave and Josette. They're dear friends of mine still to this day. But God connected me with them. And for the next year, they took me in. They opened their home to me. They may as well have given me a key because I was over there all the time. They fed me dinner, meals. They helped me get on my feet in a spiritual way. They looked after me. They taught me. They protected me. I'd call up on a Friday night. Hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're not really doing anything. We're just kind of hanging out. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but they're probably thinking, you know, we're hoping to have a nice quiet night together for just us. We've been married less than a year. And I'd say, well, can I come over? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, come over. And I'd come over and they'd be sitting on the couch and I'd, I'd say, okay, give me the popcorn. Let me sit between you. And I'd sit between them. No, not really. But, but you get the idea. I was a third wheel all the time. But that didn't matter to them because of their love for God and their love for me. They took me in when I was alone, when I was wounded, when I needed help. They took me in like this good Samaritan did. They were good neighbors to me and I can only hope that I've been the same toward others. I, I hope I have been, I think I have been but I hope I have been, why? Because that's what a follower of Jesus Christ looks like. That's how a follower of Christ lives. See, again, we're in this bigger picture here of what following Jesus looks like. Well, following Jesus looks like being a good neighbor, not just friendly to those in your neighborhood, but actually helping people in need. And those people in need that God puts in your path don't walk past them on the other side of the road like the priest. God has put them in your path because he wants to use you in their lives. It will be messy. It may be awkward and uncomfortable. It will require sacrifice. But that's what, that's what loving God and serving his people is all about. That's what we're called to do. That's what it means to follow Jesus. So the question is, are you willing to pay that price? Have you counted that cost of following him? I hope you have. 
because that's what we're required to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for delivering us, for showing us how to love. God, thank you for the high calling of being ambassadors for Christ and being good neighbors to all. We're so grateful. Jesus, you, you showed us the way. You gave us the example to follow. And God, help us to do that, to follow your example. Help us, Lord, to really walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit and help us to be faithful with those people that you put in our path. Faithful as a steward, Lord, entrusted with the souls of others. Help us, God, to be faithful. Not to be so busy that we don't have time, but to rearrange our schedules when you call us to do that. And so, Lord, we commit our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day today. Hope you can come out and join us. And, um, yeah, look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning if you can make it. God bless.